loyalty, honor, and respect. When you lose even one of those, you take something away from those around you. The ones you love, your friends, we let down those closest to us without ever realising we'd done so. The people that didn't leave work at night. They weren't the railways for the love of railways. They weren't silenced. They weren't subdued. They just didn't have anything to object to. By the time they realised there was a problem, it was too late. We didn't stifle them. We didn't lock them away, we didn't lie to them, we committed the worst sin of all, we just didn't listen. On the 6th of October 2015, the world was reintroduced to the horrors and suffering that began on a small island off the northwest coast of England. I don't think the documentary showed anything we didn't already know. People had just become desensitised to what had happened to Thomas and his friends. The reaction, or rather, overreaction began straight away. <coughs> This young man in the USA had become so traumatised by Shed 17, he had memorised all the dialogue and would do nothing but watch the programme in a loop, mouthing the words. He would later be taken away to a psychiatric unit. Many viewers would be offered similar treatment, often being asked to illustrate what scared them, and confronting it as a successful therapy. This young man began making his own model railway stories as a form of treatment. Soon many of these people would be allowed limited access to the outside world, even beginning to form social connections to people and in some cases form friendships. After the Thomas incident became public, the tourist trade began to dry up people stopped coming to Sodor for biofusion operations and so there were massive layoffs on the railway itself. Numerous attempts were made to salvage the tourist trade on Sodor. Finally, in a last ditch attempt, the railway was promoted with an ill-judged celebrity endorsement. Of the train. But it wouldn't just be young people suffering. Many would suffer trauma in their own way, both human and biofused. <laughs> With the documentary came the public outcry and the media's need for a scapegoat. The Goethe family were in Aiden. The fat c had vanished with all his money, and there I was, in full public view, being blamed for I'm the sorry. whole thing. I'm sorry, do you want to apologise, person? You, frankly, you should know better than that. <laughs> Bloody hell. I was finally given the chance to tell my side of the story on national television, tell people what actually happened, and acquit myself in the eyes of the public. Mr Hartley! Are you to blame for the events on Soldar Island? Well, let me tell you, I am not. I am totally to blame for what happened to Thomas and all his friends, and i do it again tomorrow. Last time I go on Channel 4. But the public outcry would bring an anonymous whistleblower out into the light. Someone who would reveal more facts about the events on Soldar Island, both before and after the Thomas incident. I worked closely on the television series in the early 80s. 
so I was around the engines at all times. It's only now, after I can't make a difference to those engines' lives, that I've heroically decided to speak. As the government finally relented and shut down the whole biofusion operation on Sodor, a tragic dilemma faced the scientists. Some people were still in the biofusion process. Being in process is the last place anyone wants to be. They had to complete their procedures quickly, or they'd be left to die. That meant turning them into the simplest form of life that existed. Trucks, particularly the faceless ones, rarely had the brain capacity to retain long-term memory. They were the lucky ones. I can't imagine a worse hell than being a truck. Fortunately, most of them didn't live long. The biological organs' exposure to the open world meant an increased risk of infection and slow, painful death. Fearing being shut away forever, some trains would seek opportunity elsewhere. Chris Duck Dixon and Oliver Surname's dream was to work on the famous Sodor Railway. They were childhood friends who shared the same love of trains. They'd made a pact to become engines. Sadly, it came too late. The ban on biofusion came into effect just after Oliver and Duck were looking forward to working on the railway. When it looked as though they would be locked away forever, the Japan Railway Group offered them work on their railway. Duck and Oliver jumped at the chance. The travel was paid for by the Japanese railway and they couldn't wait to be there. Unfortunately, arriving in Tokyo, Duck and Oliver would find that, under Japanese law, they weren't recognised as human beings, and so had no rights at all. They would soon learn their true fate. They, along with other engines unfortunate enough to fall into this trap, were to take part in a sick, pay-per-view event. Fitted with pneumatic joints, stabilizers and supports, they were ready for the main event. Both knew this was a battle to the death, so they had to put their friendship aside. There was only one way to survive.
other engines would welcome opportunities offered by the British government. The British government had banned the use of biofusion publicly, but couldn't ignore the military opportunities. Selling war to the world was too profitable. Hit Logistics was the military contractor secretly tasked with continuing the work Sodor research had begun. The first task was finding as many engines as possible. Biofuse material had become rare, and Hit Logistics immediately recruited people to hunt down as many decommissioned engines as possible. One was an old colleague we all called friend. Even when he was being interviewed for the Shed 17 documentary, he was neck deep in secret government research. His biggest dream was much more sinister. Project G1 was Professor Owen Ruth's dream. The breaking down of biofused matter to their very cells, and then deprogramming them. Engine remains being reused to form anything they wanted. I'm the project. These cells have their DNA instructions removed. Biofuel stem cells, which can then adapt and assume any form necessary. It is for this purpose we have begun making extensive research into twins. Annie Clarabella and Kevin Diesel had met as real enthusiasts, fallen in love and gotten married within weeks of meeting. The next step in their eyes was to become biofused. It was the most romantic thing in their eyes. He would become an engine, she a coach, and they would ride the rails together. Kevin became his namesake, a sleek black diesel engine. It was Annie's operation where things didn't go to plan. As Annie's cells were being reprogrammed, they split in the early stages of the operation, and two coaches were created, although these twins were far from identical. People started to notice just how many twins were being created on the island, but the questions were brushed off or ignored. In an effort to deflect criticism, Annie and Clarabelle, the first two biofused coaches, were put into service straight away. Everyone was very excited. No one seemed to ask about where all the organic parts were in a coach. All about those luxurious, expensive pink leather furnishings. I don't even want to tell you what they found in the toilets. Following this disaster, Annie and Clarabelle would be kept out of the public gaze. One would stay with her husband, the other sent away to hit logistics. Diesel was forced to make a heartbreaking choice. Which of these ladies to spend the rest of his life with? It must have taken him all of two seconds. For Annie, a lifetime with her husband, hidden away from the public gaze. For Clarabelle, the safety and care of hit logistics. Hit logistics weren't just interested in how twins were created. It was the abilities they had because of it. The telepathic links between twin engines was found to be incredibly powerful. The psychic links found in natural twins is profoundly more powerful in biofused vehicles. Of course, essentially, these are the same person. Hit Logistics would use what they had learnt to work on duplication. A volunteer soldier could be biofused exponentially, creating copies of those cells. Think of it! A willing human participant, not just controlling a weapon, but becoming the weapon. 
able to react to danger and orders in a fraction of the time. To maintain the secrecy of these illegal experiments, the soldiers' faces would be covered up, so that the only giveaway was a cry of discomfort when a vehicle was damaged or a tank shell was fired. But Professor Ruth wanted to take these experiments further to duplicate his deprogrammed cells to assimilate any biofuse matter it made contact with, to assume any form of any size. Think of the possibilities. A weapon dropped into a city that can take any form it wishes and adapt any organic material it finds. Whole communities of people removed and left empty for occupation. Stage 1 is the secure storage of biofuels genetic matter in stasis. Stage 2 will involve the release of this material, in secure conditions of course. To release this material in an uncontrolled state would be disastrous. There was nothing they wouldn't try in that place, even experimenting with mirrors. As well as mirror testing, work on twins would become more extreme to test just how far the telekinetic link in biofused matter would go. For one set of twins, the link would go too far. Whilst unseen horrors were administered on Donald, the doctors and specialists at Hit Logistics could observe in full detail the torture as an unbreakable bond with his twin would tear Douglas apart. Hit Logistics would also be seen as a welcome refuge from another threat on Sodor. Steamies we called them. They started out as rail enthusiasts, train spotters. They loved engines, but where was the arm in that? But when living engines were introduced on Sodor, they couldn't get here fast enough. Most were seen as enthusiastic volunteers on the railway, some getting permanent jobs. Now the Steamy's obsession with engines had a new, darker place to vent their frustrations. James was a favourite engine. Sometimes every night for weeks they'd gather at the turntable and play a spin the engine. <laughs> this security footage hidden by Sodor research until now, shows Gordon desperately pretending he couldn't fit on the turntable. But James was always the favourite, even to the television writers. James as driver and fireman were feeling him all over. But I had nothing to do with any of that business. Not after the first time. With the closure of the railways, the engines were hidden away and the steamies would go underground and bide their time. And it would be 30 years and a new documentary before anyone cared. Before anyone asked, why did this happen? Where were the engines? And what can we do about any of it? With protests aimed at the government and hit logistics, the destruction of the evidence was speeded up. Unnecessary engines would be incinerated, quickly and brutally. As easy as signing a form, ticking a box or waving a flag, the engines we knew and loved were murdered in the most efficient way possible.
but it would be the most insignificant death of all that would have the most devastating effect. Not any transport at hit logistics, but the one nobody witnessed, except for one. They'd spent 30 years together, just looking into each other's eyes, forgotten by us all, and as happy as any of us could ever hope to be. As Clarabelle was disposed of, no one but Diesel knew what happened to her twin, nearly 20 miles away. Annie, my love, what's wrong? What's the matter? What's happening? Annie, please! Stay with me! Please. I can't go! <laughs> Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. No. 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 it wasn't over for Diesel. He had to get out. As terrible as seeing his wife perish was, the worst was yet to come. No. 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 Secrets of Sodor will be revealed. The state-sponsored torture of engines must be stopped. Diesel would form the Sodor Liberation Front. His dream was to make Sodor Island a home for engines and other transport, free from the tyranny of human beings. And we will not stop until the island of Sodor is recognized as a refuge for all engines. Meanwhile, the remains of the engines would be disposed of. The remains at Hit Logistics would be moved off site to a quarry in the Blue Mountains of Sodor. 6,000 pounds of desiccated biofused matter. Its location, the real mystery. And tending to this top secret site was the only engine in the UK still being illegally operated. Oh, we can get to do pretty much anything we want to. Uh, you know, a bit of a uh, bit, bit of the black stuff. Yeah, yeah, a bit of the black stuff. Uh, yeah. This <laughs> undercover footage reveals how Ferdinand was being forced to work, controlled by his addiction to Welsh yeah, coal. Do you want this, yeah, right? Come on. Do, yeah, do yeah, it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, you're gonna work yeah. for it. Hey, yeah. 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 Do you want yeah. some of this? Some we use Welsh coal to get the weaker engines started up, to give some engines a kick when they were struggling to get up in the morning. We never realised all the effects it was having on right, some here, engines. Here, here, here the coal, man. No? no? No, what are you looking at me for? Oh, let's all look at a funny engine! Is that right? Let's all look at a funny engine! 
You gotta look at the bloody engine! Welsh Coal acted as a narcotic on the engines. Prolonged use would lead to addiction and dependency. As Welsh coal addiction became a bigger and bigger problem, dependency increased on the set of the television series. No, you'll never win first prize, Percy moaned. Don't worry, Percy, Thomas puffed. All I need is a good watchdog. One morning, Gordon was in the yard taking on a large supply of coal. That's the third load of coal you've had today, Gordon. Some might say you're being rather greedy. Increasingly, engines would cause what appeared to be accidents, but in fact were attempts to get exposed to Welsh coal. But prolonged use would result in permanent brain damage. Dealers on the set, violence among the actors, we knew there were a problem when Gordon started talking to the voice in his head, telling him to do things, bad things. Yes, said Gordon, I will. Hit Logistics would later take Welsh coal research to its natural conclusion. High speed steam engines would be pushed to their limits on high doses of the coal. As pressure from the media increased, and fearing more bad press, Project G1 was put on hold, its future uncertain. Stage 1 stored away in what Professor Ruth called a controlled environment. He dug his own grave, appearing in that documentary, as well as working at Hit Logistics. But he didn't see anything wrong in that. And so, just like everyone else, he blamed me for everything, even Smudger. Smudger's story had been a children's favourite around the world. Smudger worked on the mid Sodor Railway. The mine the engines worked on didn't make much, but it was enough to keep them going. Smudger was moved there because of his faults. His wheel alignment was off, meaning he'd come off the rails too often. Unfortunately, the cash-strapped mine company couldn't afford the repairs. Their solution would be barbaric. They dismembered him, taking away his wheels and opening him up. The butchers turned him into a steam generator. Shut off from all sensation, Smudger powered the mind for many years. Alone with his thoughts, he would slowly lose his mind. When business dried up, do you think they come back for Smudger? Did they, Al? He were left there for years. Everyone had forgotten him. In a way, it would have been better for Smudger if he'd been forgotten forever. Sadly, for Smudger, salvation would arrive, but in the form of hit logistics. Professor Roof was still eager to find as much biofused material as he could. But Smudger had changed over time. Smudger had remained in the same place for nearly 30 years. His organic parts were no longer just part of a steam engine. They had become shed. Smudger and the shed were one and the same. They couldn't be wait, removed. Wait, wait. Hey, no, no, please, wait, no, please, no, oh God, no, 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 please, wait, no, no, please, no, God, no, no. This would be the final act of Hit Logistics, closing down all their research and destroying evidence. Soon, there would be nothing left to even prove their existence. That was what they hoped. They didn't count on one final desperate act. Frankie had been driven mad by all the things he'd seen working for the government. 
but the worst thing was having to keep it quiet for all those years. Unfortunately, Cranky's genetic structure meant he couldn't turn around fully, not without breaking the entire circulatory system to his head. Effectively, he was condemning himself to a painful death. I believe Cranky knew the consequences, and he knew it had to be done. But his wouldn't be the only sacrifice that day. I don't believe he was evil, or that he wanted to kill anyone. He just wanted to show the world what the government was trying to cover up. He didn't know what was in there, or the damage he'd do. Diesel had veered into the now secured stasis container of Project G Stage 1. Opening it up and allowing the deprogrammed biofused matter to assimilate any matter it wished and to take on any form it wished. Biofused engines in there didn't stand a chance. They were dragged into the canister. And then we all got to see it in its natural state. situation sunk in, government forces were deployed. This would be the only line of defence. But Project G1 was more than capable of defending itself and would take whatever action was necessary. It could now not be stopped. As it forged ahead, it became clear where its goal was. More biofuse cells, more life, more engines. It had to assimilate cells to grow, to live, to spread. Blue Mountain Quarry. The site of thousands of tons of dead, desiccated biofuse matter hidden from the outside world. A rich source of matter which would make Project G1 indestructible. It were drawn here to be with its own kind. The last vestiges of Sodor's engines it was trying to find peace. Realising Project G1's destination and intent, the military provided it with what it was looking for. The 
last engine whose fate everyone had asked about for years. After 28 operations to try and reconstruct him as a human being, he had remained behind closed doors, unwilling, until now, to show the world the monster he had become. That wasn't the Thomas I knew. That wasn't an engine or a human. It were a creature mutilated by surgeons and engineers alike. Unable to react to the outside world at this stage, Thomas was the last chance the military had to stop Project G1. Finally, the nightmare were over. Thomas had found the remains of his friends. His friends had found him. Sodor Island's favourite sons would finally be at no! The mystery of the Blue Mountain had been solved. 6,000 tons of desiccated, dehumanized, biofused matter hidden in full view. And now used as a weapon.
this was the military's plan all along. There was never any intention to allow them some kind of peace. And with that, Thomas lost his only link to the past. Now all that's left is his reanimated pneumatic body. A confused mind that lost everything. With his past the only thing left to torment him, Thomas decided to leave. He'd seen everything. The last people he trusted had abandoned him. But I was still here to tell his story. After all the betrayal, disloyalty and torment, I could still say I were his only friend. The only person who hadn't abandoned him. I could hold my head up high and say I was... <laughs> That will not be necessary. Who, who are you? Who is this man? What's he doing here? This man is in who, who, our who, who, care. You have no right to be here. Relax, Mr. Hartley. You are in our capable hands now. Well, Mr. Hartley, you've been quite the fawn in our side. The wrench in our works, the leaves on our rails. Never want to shy away from the media, were you, Mr. Hartley? Always another revelation about your faithful employer. Never a care for the trouble you caused, the innovations you've hampered, initiatives you've stalled, the jobs you've lost, the challenges to this island's human supremacy. Well, we've got a very special place for you here, somewhere you can't open your big mouth or interfere anymore. And don't worry, Mr. Hartley. You're among friends here. 
This is where everyone ends up. Once they've become... troublesome. Colonel Babar, his bloodthirsty rise to power, the genocide of the Rhinoceros Kingdom, and his ultimate demise at the hands of his own people. I don't know about this. Maybe we shouldn't be here. Yeah, come on. No one's even been here in like 50 years. Uh, I know, but these warning signs are here for a reason. Look, no one's actually seen an engine over there for ages. It'll be fine. What are you worrying about? I mean, what could happen? Ah. Ah. No! 